so tell me, tell me about, because I, your, your bio says that you've actually helped individuals to get into the CBD business in the United States uh, and in Ireland. And uh, so talk mm-hmm. a little bit about that, how those companies, I think he's, I think it was 12 companies that you helped to get into business. Mm-hmm. Tell us about the inception, how that starts, uh, how someone can reach out to you, how you can help them to get in business into the CBD business as well. It, quite honestly, it normally starts because either someone has referred me like you referred uh, me to Larry. Uh, and Larry picked up the ball and we had several conversations and we, we, we could tell there was some like-mindedness. Uh, we talked about uh, what his needs were. His needs were to educate first. Um, in the middle of that, we talked about products. I educated him on what the products were, how much those products would cost him wholesale, and more importantly, what, excuse me, he could sell those products for retail. Um, and he put in orders and we, he is, he has gone through many life cycles of these products. So that's one way it's through relationships like anything else. I, if I go and I speak, I normally have, I don't know, 20, 30 people that want to talk to me afterwards. I get their cards. I always follow up with them or they call me before I can even get home. And they're interested in starting their own private labels. It just so happens that today, one of the uh, farmers and the farmer's sister that I met in, in Buford at the last uh, session with Larry, actually we made contact today. So I'm gonna be working with her, um, expanding what she's already doing out in the marketplace, which is not uh, real robust on the CBD side. Um, but again, that's a potential client. When I spoke in Vancouver uh, at the Art View Summit, Um, There were international clients there and a couple of them approached me about helping them do private label products. Uh, I have a a creative director uh, on board that is just second to none. So we can take a concept and turn it around pretty quickly and give a client um, choices to look at to private label their products. There are minimums. You're always going to get have minimums when you're trying to white label or private label. So some products, there is one, a 100 unit minimum. Others, we can probably go down to 50, particularly if we're putting your label on it. Um, so I get clients that way. Um, I get clients because I've been in the tea business. They know the quality of the product that I've done in that in the other in my other life and have asked me to do something similar uh, on the on the THC vein. So I get I get business just like anybody else would. Um, speaking engagements probably at the top of the list. Um, people that you know word of mouth. Secondly, and thirdly, you know we have pro- products out there. Um, I, I think the other thing is when people see my products, they're professional and um, they don't look like a startup did it. It doesn't look homemade. It looks like something that could go on anybody's shelf. I can put it in Whole Foods. I can put it in GNC. I can put it anywhere. And it's going to stand up to any Procter & Gamble product that's sitting on a shelf. And that's the other thing that we need to understand. If we're going to put a product out there with all the competition, it's got to look the part. It certainly has to do um, uh, what what it's supposed to do from an efficacy perspective, but it's got to look the part. When the when the customer walks past the shelf, are they going to pick up your product and look at it? And that's all I'm really after, because I know uh, from the number of milligrams and all of the other things um, that that we might be equal. I want my product to stand out. Um, So I have gotten um, the the clients that I have through a variety of means, but mostly, uh, as I've mentioned, through speaking engagements and word of mouth. Okay. So if someone wants to reach out to you and they have interest and they mm-hmm. actually want to start their own business, they, mm-hmm. they, uh, particularly those that already have, uh, you know, they're already in the CBD business or they would like to enter the CBD business. Sure. How can they reach you? Uh, y at wisehemp.com. Okay. And, and spell Y for them. W-Y okay. at wisehemp. Now, wisehemp is spelled W-I-S-E-H-E-M-P. Dot com and make a wise choice. Make a wise choice. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, Tori, if you could place that down in the comments, uh, y at ysimp.com, that'd be great. So now, so now I, I really want to get into this uh, because I've been to a couple of conferences 
I, I remember going to the Black Enterprise Conference here a couple of years ago, and they had this topic, this topic about cannabis and hemp. And uh, I hear the capital, particularly if you want to be a grower, I hear the capital is is enormous trying to get into the industry. So what type of capital is needed and uh, and how do people get capital to get into that that industry? OK, two questions, um, okay. two questions there. Um, the amount of money that's necessary to get into the industry, particularly we were talking specifically about growing. It depends on the number of acres. It depends on if that farmland has been utilized before. What was it utilized for? Is it organic farming or not? Um, again, how many acres do you have? Are you trying to just plant a couple of acres to see what happens? Or are you going full board? You've got 100 acres and you're going to do that. Um, the amount of money that it takes is difficult for me to tell you what that is without knowing more specifics about what the farmer's intentions are. Are they growing the product because they're also going to do the processing and extraction? Are they growing the product for food? Are they growing the product for fiber? Are they growing the product for um, fuel, food, fiber, fuel? Or are they growing the product for, as I call it, feel good uh, because they wanted to go into some of these products? So you, they have to have a strategy about what, why, how are they growing the product and what are they growing it for? You know, um, BMW uses uh, hemp in their car doors. Houses are being built with hemp treat. Um, so you have to do your research and figure out where you think you're, you're, you're aligning yourself with in order for, for you to figure out what your budget should be. Because then you, you, you say they use hemp for the car doors. Explain that to me. So that hemp can be made. It's such a durable, um, uh, just unbelievable fiber. You know, hemp was part of our, our culture um, hundreds of years ago. You know, our, our currency was printed on hemp. Uh, everybody was growing hemp during, you know, George Washington days. So it's just kind of come full circle. So they use hemp um, to uh, make the sturdiness of the car doors because of the tactile strength of that hemp fiber. Uh, certainly they make clothes out of it. They um, make um, all sorts of industrial uses for hemp. So if you're a farmer, you know, what is, how are you, um, going to distribute your product. Let me give you another example. There's a large, major, multinational pharmaceutical company that has uh, chains all over the country. Um, they want to get into CBD in a very big way. Now, let's just think about this for a moment. This product is everywhere now, all of a sudden. It's in gas stations. It's, you know, obviously different quality, but it's everywhere. So here's this large drugstore chain and they say, hmm, we're going to, we want to be the leaders in this hemp CBD thing. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, they're going to start off buying it from people like me or, or, or large wholesalers, large producers. But at some point in time, if they do that, their supply chain will be thoroughly, um, uh, it, their, their supply chain uh, won't be as routine as it should be. So what they're doing is going directly to farmers and asking farmers to grow for them. It's brilliant because now I'm a farmer. I've got 5,000 acres, 50,000 acres, and I'm growing for a very large uh, drugstore chain. I know when I put my seed in the ground that I've got a buyer. And what does the drugstore chain get out of it? They get a supply chain they can depend on. Now that's, albeit weather, weather related calamities might happen. But other than that, they've already secured their product. Now, what if they're doing this all over the country? They won't be going to brokers for their product. They won't be waiting to see um, who might be growing X amount of thousands of pounds of hemp. They already know because they've got farmers that they're working with. So when you have that kind of situation, where your your crop is already sold before you put the seed in the ground, that's a different amount of money that you need. You can also probably go and get that banked or you can get private equity. Banks, excuse me, are still hesitant to provide loans 